being made. And as people migrated, they brought with them the vines. And this process occurred 3,000 years ago until now, still happening. And the vines occasionally would, when they got to a certain region, they were self-pollinating, but they could still cross-pollinate. And uh, so, for example, Chardonnay, there is a village in Burgundy called Chardonnay, and that grape is the white, premier white grape of Burgundy. It is, we now know from genetic studies, it is the offspring of Pinot Noir and another very minor grape that still exists called Gouet Blanc. And <clears throat> Pinot Noir then becomes apparent, and when you look at the history of Pinot Noir, it's been there a very long time. On the other hand, when we look at Syrah, until very recently, it was thought that Syrah was brought to the Rhone Valley, which is where we'll be heading north of uh, here. And it's the primary grape of the northern part of the Rhone Valley uh, by um, crusaders returning. In fact, there is a place there called Hermitage, which is um, the place where we know a crusader came back and became sort of a hermit and, uh, and died there. And they, they uh, attributed the fact that the Syrah grape was there because they thought he brought it back from Persia, and particularly from Shiraz. So the Australians, when they picked up that grape variety, called, instead of calling it Syrah, which, of course, given the French rules, nobody knows what the grape variety is. You only know it's a Rhone grape or it's a Burgundy grape. They said, well, we'll give it a name that's kind of fancy, and we think it came from Persia. And all of these grapes, as I said, originated from up in that area. <clears throat> well, recent genetic studies have shown, DNA studies, which have been doing with grapes, show that that grape variety was very much indigenous, at least 3,000 years there, and um, gave rise to other grape varieties they have in the region, but is pretty much a local grape when look at it that way. Um, in Bordeaux, we have Cabernet Sauvignon, which everybody knows, but in fact, it is the offspring of two other Bordeaux grapes, DNA studies show, um, Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. And, but those grapes have been there a long time. So we have these different varieties in these regions, and one would say, well, that's just the way it was historically. Those grapes came down, they cross-pollinated, and you end up with these different varieties in those regions. And that is true. But why didn't Cabernet Sauvignon be brought into Burgundy? And why didn't Pinot Noir be brought into Bordeaux? And that's where history and politics come in. Because <clears throat> originally, politically, they were separate entities. And you, um, and, and of course, these grapes were growing in places that were very comfortable growing. Limestone, in some cases, for the soil, stony, rocky soil, and others, as in Bordeaux. And so they were happy there. But they could be transplanted. You could grow Chardonnay in Bordeaux. There is no question. But they don't. And John, I don't think they drink very much Chardonnay in Bordeaux. No. It's also in Yon Blanc. So there's a lot of history and there's some politics. There's even um, uh, the fact that uh, Gamay, there's a village of Gamay in Burgundy. And originally, the Gamay grape, which was named after the village, I guess, was located there. And one of the dukes of Burgundy built the, <laughs> built the bowl, yeah, built the bowl one of the four famous Phillips in the region. 1385, my historian says, said that it was a Friday. It was a Friday, Patrick said. Declared that Gamay was a disloyal grape. Said it's a disloyal grape. And so he banned it from Burgundy. Went south, where it actually was a lot happier in the warmer stony soils of uh, Beaujolais. So you have politicians getting into the act, 
And then you say, well, why uh, don't we today? Because we get past history and we look at the market. Uh, Cabernet, they discovered in Italy, is uh, a great thing to sell to Americans. And so, um, and the, the Italians waived their laws uh, say 15 or 20 years ago and started growing Cabernet Sauvignon, where they used to grow only the Chianti style grape, the, the Sangiovese. Well, in France, um, they have rules and regulations about what you can plant, how much you can plant, when you can fertilize, or you can't fertilize, basically, and when you can irrigate. And the answer is you really can't irrigate unless there's some emergency, I guess. And so you have very strict laws here about what you can grow and what you can't grow. And part of that, those people in marketing commented to me the other day, is brand identification as well as quality. Now, the thing that is puzzling about the French, um, and I don't know if it reflects on politics or just um, marketing strategies, is that they don't, except for the former German region of Alsace, they don't put the grape variety on the label. They're not allowed to on an AOC wine, a quality wine, a controlled wine. You see Merlot and Cabernet and a lot of the wines have been drinking the last couple of days. Those are not high quality wines. It's ironic that those are the, what we would call in the States jug wines. So those cheaper wines are the ones that we can identify much easier and say, I want some of that. But, uh, and I don't know that they're ever going to change that in France. There's a huge surplus of wine here in France. I think 30% of the production now, most of it from the south, is converted to uh, distillation to alcohol. Um, now, that's not unique to France. Australia has the same problem over production. But when we get down to what you call a wine in France, it's going to be where it comes from. And so, when we are now um, heading to Bandol, and uh, one of the wines that, as John says, one of my favorites, with a grape variety called Morvedra, which is uh, a grape variety that gives the body to Chateau Neuf de Pop, which we will also see tomorrow. Um, and it's a blend. In the southern part of, of uh, the Rhone Valley, they're allowing up to 13 different grape varieties to be used in the wine that they sell. That's the law, and they, you know, you can grow hundreds of different grapes all through France and all through Italy. Uh, but they allow 13 to be used in the blend in the region, we will see later. Grenache and so forth, which we tasted yesterday, gives wonderful fruity, nice deep colors, and it's a very, very tasty grape. But Morvedro, when it's a little on the wimpy side, they'll throw in some Morvedro. And they're doing that more now today for, uh, I think, the American market. They're beefing their wines up because uh, Robert Parker, the critic, likes them. And so Morvedro is the beef. That's where you get the body to the wine. We're going to taste that later today. And I hope you like it. If you like light wines, you're not going to be crazy about that. But here I am. I love Pinot Noir of the reds, this is one of my favorites. So it's a mouthful. Uh, sometimes almost too tannic, and quite often that's why uh, it's not that popular, I guess. Uh, but it is becoming more grown in California, and so we may see more of that brand. But when we get to Chateau Neuf de Pomp, you're going to see a blend that is now dominated by Grenache, the great Grenache, which in Spain is called Garnacha. And it's a wonderful grape. I mean, you really have a hard time knocking that. It makes great rosés. My favorite rosés are made from Grenache. And uh, with some more Vedra thrown in there. And then they're diluted with what I call grapes that are low-quality, high-yield grapes. And you'll occasionally hear them referred to by the winemakers. Uh, you know, Carignan, for example, is thrown in there just to kind of stretch it out a bit, watering, not really watering them but it's stretching the wine production out. So in the southern Rhone, which is 90% of the Rhone Valley production, but like everything, when you have high volume, quite often you don't get the prices that the lower volume wines uh, 
in Britain. In the northern Rome, which we will see later, the wines there can run $400 a bottle easily. For the place we're going, Wigal, makes wines that are jokingly referred to as the Lala's because they all start with La, uh, La Moline, and so forth, and they sell for $400 a bottle. Uh, we may taste some of Wigal's wines, I don't know that they'll give us the Lala's. Uh, there's a white grapes in this region as well, in, in uh, Chateau Neuf de Pop. The white Chateau Neuf de Pop, someone said, uh, was it you, Marty, that you wanted to taste that? Um, there's a white grape in that blend that I love called Rassan. And it's pure in Australia, they grow it. Australia does the Rhone Valley wines, you probably know the Shiraz, they do Marsan. Uh, it's a very nice wine. And Viognier, which my sister knows, is one of my favorite whites, and I've shared that with her, is one that comes from Quadru, up in that northern region, and it's a wonderful white grape. So we'll see some good whites and some good reds. And Tavel, which is at the southern end of this region, is known and has been for a long time for its rosé. Dry, wonderful rosés. If, if I were to buy a rosé, and I do occasionally, uh, I like them in that style. If you like this, it's not the pink Zin. It's not, you know, uh, Kool-Aid with alcohol. Uh, it's, it's got good acidity. To be a good food wine, you must have acidity. And to compete with heavy beef or something like that, you need a lot of body and a lot of uh, bouquet. And these are wines in this region that you can have with barbecue any day of the week, uh, the red wines. And um, the whites are good food wines. I consider Chardonnay to be one of the worst food wines there is, and it's the most popular white wine in the world. And I think in America it's much too soft, not enough acidity, and way too much oak in it. The French do a much better job with Chardonnay, but Burgundy is a very small region. Uh, this region in the Rhone has over 200,000 acres of vines, uh, which I think makes it the second largest region in France. So there's a lot of wine made in the southern Rhone where we'll be seeing an Avignon and Chateau Neuf de Pop and all that. The northern Rhone prices go up even more. Chateau Neuf de Pop can easily cost $100 a bottle. Um, and I think those are all wonderful wines. Uh, we'll see some very high quality wines there. When you get in the very south of France, it's like our San Joaquin Valley. There's a lot of grapes. Uh, the quality is not as high because, quite honestly, even though you won't see it today, it's too warm. And what you get is a very high yield with not much acidity so that they're not really good food wines, but they're cheap. You know, the wines that we have been seeing, you can get five, ten dollars a bottle. And relative to the Rhone, which is a hundred dollars and more in many cases. So politics had a lot to do with the regulations and how they're named. Uh, did you have a question? How do you judge Oh, how do you judge acidity? I take all that for granted, and I forget to say, I need to give you a little bit of definition. Dryness is whether a wine is sweet or not, and not whether or not it's tannic. Most of my students misuse the term dry, because when a wine has tannins, your mouth feels very dry, it puckers up, and you feel like, I need a glass of water now to follow this wine. Um, but acidity makes your mouth water. And anything that you have with food, if you're going to taste the food, you need to have saliva in your mouth. The saliva is what transmits those tastes. And bouquet, aroma, is what transmits flavor. So acidity, so is if you drink that wine and your mouth feels moist afterwards, and you feel the, the saliva coming from under your tongue. That's when, and it, another way of saying is that it's sour, but not vinegar sour. And that really cleanses your palate and makes you ready for another bite. Uh, if you have a very oaky Chardonnay that is what I call fat, 
that has no acidity, once you've had it in your mouth, you don't really want much more. And by the way, the alcohol is so high, you can't drink as much of it. In France, the alcohol is usually lower. The Rhone Valley is the one exception. Because it's warm, we'll see 14 and 15 percent alcohol, where in Burgundy, if you saw 12, it would be high. So you have uh, acidity, which is a burning feeling. I'm sorry, uh, uh, moisture. You have alcohol, which is a burning feeling. You have uh, astringency from the tannins. And the more vetra will dry your mouth out. We had one yesterday that dried your mouth out. And the only way that you can get past that is to let it age for about 10 years. And all of the color and all those tannins come from the skins of the grape. So um, chemically speaking, they polymerize over time. And the color changes from purple to orange, and you get a sediment in the bottom of the bottle. That's all that tannin dropping out of the wine. And then it tastes nice and soft. Or not as tannin. Yeah, look at that. Does anybody want to get up and take a picture from here or look? You want to get up? Okay, let's do it. That was Dr. Jews. Um, a quick lecture on wines and tasting of wine and some definitions as we continue our tour today.